Hello. I think I'm good. I appear to have sound. Nothing's gone horribly wrong so far. So, I saw a bunch of people here chatting amongst themselves, which is great. So, who we got here? Uh, William, Dave, Ray, Johnny. And what else we got here? Fred, Ian, David. Ah, Rob's here as well. Cool. Peter, oh, sorry, Pete. Christian as well. Excellent. Hello, everyone. So I'm a bit tired today. I was up until about three o'clock this morning tinkering with something. Um, I was actually hoping to get it working, but I've still got lots of things to do. I'm, I'm trying to write some software, but um, I haven't got it working yet. So there's not much to show. I think I might bring it up actually and show you what I'm working on. It's probably interest Rob certainly. Uh, if I remember where the program is, because I've restarted my computer this morning for a live stream, so I always do. Let's reduce the bugs. Andy, how's it going? Let's get this start up and I'll show you what I was tinkering with. Uh, open recent files. We want. That one, I think. That's fine. Okay. Here we go. It's working. All right. Try some top window. So it's a small window, so it's a bit hard for you to see, but that thing there. This is the user interface I've built so far. Um, it's not functional yet. I'm still trying to sort some stuff out. So what I'm actually building here is an Apple software for working with Siglent equipment. All right, that's what I'm trying to build. So um, it's not working yet. I've got. I'm really rusty in building software. It's been a decade since I built any software, so really rusty on it. Um, so I'm going to sort of get my head back into it and remember how to use this bloody software and stuff like that. So what I'm basically doing here is you've got an IP address, you tell it what the device is on your network, you give it the port number, and um, this is a loop delay, so if you want to send the same command over and over again, such as a sampling command, then you can um, tell it the, the timing, so if you don't run it too fast. This is a single command, so you just send that on once, it will send it once, and this one here will send the loop, so keep sending the same command over and over again um, and down here should be what comes back from the device I don't have this working yet so what I've got is user interface built um, I can try and send a command doesn't appear to get there so the actual networking part isn't working yet but um, basically Siglent support um, PC software absolutely fine but there's no Mac support and as I use a Mac and as I wanted to be able to do things like get on-screen readings, um, this will allow me to do that. So if I'm doing a live stream, like I'm doing now, I'm doing some repairs, it will allow me to have the values and well, from the test screens, you know, like in this case, this is for the multimeter. That's what I'm trying to read here. So I have the multimeter on screen on my Mac um, and just show the values on screen. I probably will do some different interfaces. I actually had in my mind, once I get the communication working, and I could work those bugs out and get it functional. Then I'm thinking, well, I could have multiple interfaces. So I could have a interface for like a little mini display. I could have one for doing more commands. Like this is just a query command window. So this is like me just trying to get things to work. But this can also be used. And of course, I can maybe build a graphing one, maybe, or an exporting of the CSV kind of thing, so I can do remote logging. I could do those kinds of things. And then I could also add additional equipment. Because this is Windows, right? So I can have a window for each device um, and each function. And I could also add on things like 
see the SDL, the, the loads and things like that. It could possibly add those on as well. So things that use the same protocols which can be interrogated in the same way, which can give you a textual version of the result. Um, obviously not oscilloscopes, but the um, anything else I can maybe tinker with um, or send commands to, then I could probably build into this thing. Um, I mean, if it's a skippy command based thing and I'm getting communication working, in theory you should be able to use this with anything, I think. You have to do as much as you've got the right port number to be able to communicate. Um, but like I said, I don't have this working yet. Um, but, you know, I'm intent that I'm gonna I'm gonna get it working. Yes, yeah, so that's what I'm tinkering with. I was hoping I could actually get something working last night so I can actually demo something, but it's not working yet. It says it's got a connection, but I'm not getting any data back or anything like that, so I don't think it actually does have a connection. I think it's just telling me it does, but it actually doesn't. Anyway. Hey Peter, how's it going? Andrew? Uh, so I've had four hours sleep. It's alright. And I do have a cat in here for those wanting cat action, but um, she's asleep. Um, how unusual for a cat. Anyway, yeah, so cat's here, so she might make an appearance when she wakes up and starts meowing at me. Wanting some attention. I've got another cat which has been hanging out in here too, but she's currently locked out because the door shut. Or oh, semi shut. So, uh, yeah. So I really want to get that thing working, but it's in a program called Real, Real Basic. The version I've got is quite old. It's uh, where are we here? This is like the interface here for it. Um, so you got a project window, and you can your amp criteria. Um, and I've only got one window built so far, which is this thing. And um, you can then attach the commands and, and code to it, which I'm, I've got lots of commented out code, things I was trying, things I may or may not end up using, I don't know, so, um, yeah. I've got this thing to preset the values, I'm probably going to have like a preference file, it will save details to a preference file, something like that, but I'm not down that route yet, I'm not that far down yet. So I just want to get something that will physically communicate. Once I'll get that communicating, get out the problem solved, then um, it'll be good. But I'm really, really rusty on this stuff. Really rusty. Um, I've got some software which I built years ago. Like I said, I've got a few programs. And um, once they're built, I haven't really had to do much with them. It's not like I had to do much bug testing or, like, or bug corrections. It's been pretty good. So, yeah, license to drive, how's it going? Save the milk provider, yeah. Yes, I did, Rob, thanks. I did have a quick look at those last night. Um, some of those I already found. Um, I. Yeah, there was some, the Python stuff was, was some of the things I'd already found. So, um, so I did actually have the Python communicating. So, for you guys, you I wouldn't know. Let's get this back up again. So, I was actually talking to Rob yesterday about this because Rob's the New Zealand signal dealer. He just happened to be contacting me about something whilst I was tinkering with it. Anyway, um, so I've got Python can communicate with the multimeter. And I can do queries with it and get readings back from it. So I've got the Python part working. Um, then I realised that well, okay, I've got the Python working, but so I know the communication is working from my computer to the actual multimeter. But I was thinking, well, how do I then turn this into having a nice display and have something I can more usable? I mean, sure, I can get Python to work and spit it to a CSV and stuff like that. But that's not really what I'm trying to achieve. Um, it just proved that I can actually talk to it basically. So, hey James, how's it going? So the, um, then I thought, well, okay, I'm going to sit down and start trying to write some software. Because who doesn't? Yeah, 
anyway, I like to do things by halves, don't I? Anyway. Um, so I'm going to buy one of those balls to Spot World 18650s. A 3 amp 12 volt PSU. I don't know enough about the Spot Worlders. Um, it is obviously all about impulse current, so it's the highest current you can provide in a surge. So, in theory, as long as you've got enough current to supply the capacitors which are providing the main amount of power, then I don't see why not. But then I don't know enough about them, so. Yes. Andre, how's it going? So, yes, that's, um, that's my current mind melting experience is trying to write software again after so many years. I mean, I've done web stuff, I do web stuff quite frequently, you know, um, that's not a problem, but this is obviously a very different kind of system. And it's old, it's this one I've got is from 2010, so that's an old version. If I get this working, then um, I might get a newer version of the software, but it's not cheap. Because um, I'm just thinking that if I can actually get a software which works and I get it to something which is useful to people, then it's possible I could maybe sell copies of it and help other people out. Rather than it being just for me. If it's just me, I probably wouldn't worry about it. But if I'm going to potentially sell copies, I need to make sure I'm using a newer version of software to have the best compatibility with the latest versions of Windows. Because the software can build for Mac, Linux and Windows. So that means I can actually build an app for all three. Um, but like I said, it's an old version of software. It's 2010. So um, Yeah, I'm doing 720p today. Um, I haven't dropped any frames yet. It's doing pretty well. Hopefully it stays that way. But yeah, that's probably what I'll... When I finish the stream today... I'll probably be carrying on with that software trying to get it working, but, but I'm confident I can get it to work. It's just a matter of understanding how to set the software up to use the network control. So I've never done networking stuff with it, so that's all completely new as well. Um, yeah, Dan, you don't drink it, Dave, exactly. <laughs> well, no, I brought frames. No, I'm sorry. But what I want to tinker with today, not too exciting, but I thought it might be interesting anyway. We'll do some testing and stuff. Um, why do I keep going to the window to change? I've got I've got a stream deck sitting right here. Why am I just pushing buttons on this? Like, you know. Like that. Haven't got the lighting on over there yet, so. Yeah, yeah, it's a thing. That's right, yeah, and that's one thing I did cross my mind is that like if I sell it, I'm going to have to support it. Um, so, but then I do sell all the software, and I haven't had any problems really with support. I, it's just I sell it, and it's I never hear anything again. It's fine, which is exactly what you want, you know. Um, yeah, I keep forgetting I've got a stream deck sitting right here, like you know, it's like, oh, hold on. right here. I'm going to use it. I might have bought that for me for my birthday, and I was, you know, because I said I wanted a stream deck. I actually should use it, shouldn't I? Um, right, so let's see. Um, Andrew, did I miss a comment? Oh, right. Oh, Slash N, yes. Yes, that occurred to me last night too. I did, you're right, I had forgotten to put that in. I did test it with that at one point. I'd actually type it in manually and put that in. Um, it didn't work. But that was early on, actually. I might have changed something now. What I'd actually be inclined to do is hard code that into the actual back end, so the Slash N is automatically added, so you don't actually have to put it in. Um, oh, come on, I'm going to have to do this now, aren't I? Before I forget about it again, that is a good point. Um, uh, 
Well, Snash In is is the line feed. Like Snash In is a textual representation of it. So I'm going to put that in. Um, I'm going to do it now before I forget about it. If I can really do it. So I'm actually, one of the classes I'm using is the appreciated class. I might have to look at updating that as well. Um, let's go. Um, hmm. I don't have a top screen set up on here. I need to do that. So, what I want to do is have. Where's the query? I've lost it. My query text. There. Oh god. Alright. There we go. Got a, it's got a slash in on the end there. <laughs> um I'd actually have uh, so this isn't all written yet, so I need to uh, I'm doing controls. So the loop button isn't written yet, but I've got to do something in here. I want to try, I've got to use a timer on that one. I've got to remember to use timers. So um, that'll basically send the same query over again. Um, yeah, so that's, I haven't got that yet. Okay, so that's that done. Yeah, oh, I forgot there for now. I might leave open for a bit in case I think of something else. Um, uh, you've got a GPIB adapter for that bench meter. I've got a well, I can use USB potentially. Um, GPIB adapter. Yeah, well, I've got. These engine and things sitting here, which I haven't actually used yet. Um, not even hooked up. I have to get around to that because I don't use a PC most of the time. So if I'm doing this, I have to get a PC out and do it, especially. Um, so the GPU would be adapter is that like the Agilent one, the fake Agilent ones? It's the USB you plug it in. Is it the same as that, or is it different to that? Um, okay. So to answer the question, it looks like an old Dell supply. It's not. It's a power supply for a Magic TV box, which is like a TV recorder, digital TV recorder thing. Um, thirteen and ten couch here, char thirteen to thirteen and ten, which is the um, line feed and carriage return. Yeah. Did I slash the end right around? Now you got me wondering, James. <laughs> hmm. Pretty sure it's backslash. But you're right, I'll keep that in mind. Okay. Sideline tips lasted five minutes. Wow, that's pretty bad, Andrew. T12 sideline tip, really? Well, wow. well, I've got mine off AliExpress. I have no problems with those ones. So, I don't know. But I suppose you could potentially get bad ones or peg, you know, seconds from the factory which don't work right. Um, so, a line separator. Paragraph separator, yeah, okay. 
slash r slash n. Yeah. Depends what you're doing. I mean, I found usually that n is okay. That does the job. That's what I've been doing anyway. Just looking for a character anyway. Should listen to James, he knows a bit about stuff. Because <laughs> he's if if anyone's not familiar with James's channel, you should go and watch his videos. He does some amazing stuff with it's building a computer, basically. Um and it goes through his design of circuit boards and stuff after he's done all the testing on breadboards and he's been doing this for a long time. It's very complex and it stuns me. Every time I watch one of his videos, it's like wow, it's amazing. The complexity of it. Uh, more small tips. Now to the connector for the cable got the temperature. Oh dear. Yeah, I mean, I, the AliExpress stuff I've been finding, as long as you don't get the cheapest one, I, I don't buy the cheapest. I always buy something a bit more expensive than cheapest. Just that precaution, and generally, I've not really any problems. I don't think I've had much to complain about, really, with stuff I've got from there. <laughs> space, it contains no space, yeah. Well, that's true, Andrew. I mean, is it going to be an ASCII 10 or is it going to be a slash, slash on the end? Mm, I mean, I'm, I'm com just sending it as text. So it's sending raw text, which should convert, hopefully, to the correct data. I mean, I could always do it as a character. I mean, I can do a char on the end and just do char 10 or whatever. I could do that, actually. Probably better. Yeah, actually, let's do that. Let's go back in here. Same query. Instead of this. There you go. Let's do it that way, shall we? That's bound to be okay that way. <laughs> uh. Yeah. There you go, Andrew. Yep, yeah, you're you're pretty much right. So at least in this language. I don't know what this language is. I mean it's, it's a weird sort of I mean it's called real basic, I guess it's basic interpreter, is it? I I don't know, I just started using it and trying to figure it out years ago and say so it's been ten years since I wrote any software on it. This at the moment is not actually sequenced correctly, Ian. So I am just basically sending a command out and then seeing if the multimeter responds, and I'm not getting that. So I've tried doing IDN checking for response, but the response isn't actually delayed enough. It's like immediate it's checking straight away. So it means even if the multimeter is sending something back, the buffer will be empty, so it won't actually have anything there. It's not a delay. Um, so I've got to do that. I need to put a timer on or something like that and actually get that working. I haven't got that working yet. Once I remember to use timers and delay checking for a response and I'll get, I'll get it working properly. Um, but the old mind's a bit wobbly on that right now. Um, I can't remember it, but not completely. It's not working. So it's like, uh, okay, I'll look at that later on. Um, so what I was looking at as well is doing open-ended commands. So I'm just trying to send it a command to change ranges. Right, so instead of being auto-ranging DC, I've sent a command to be in the 200 milliwatt range and see if the multimeter responds to it and actually changes and um, it's not I'm even going into remote access as well because it what happens when you do remote commands onto the multimeter the front panel becomes unresponsive it actually switches over to remote commands and so the front panel doesn't do anything anymore um, and the display doesn't update constantly and stuff like that when you start doing the measurements and that sort of thing so um, only when you do a command to it does it all update so 
I can see by the commands I'm trying to send it that the multimeter is not receiving the commands. So that's the part I'm at right now is trying to get the communication working. So I can actually send the command to the multimeter. Once we get that bit working, then I'll get ready to get back. Um, I think it is basic, yeah. Someone recommend a cheap oscilloscope. Depends how cheap and what you want to do with it. Um, I've done reviews on some very budget scopes. I've done like uh, the Must Hall, um, Unity, and a Hantec, really budgety ones. Um, and if you don't expect much, then they're fine. I think the Must Tool was the better one. Remember rightly? I've sold them all now. Um, but if you want something a bit more professional and a bit more reliable and faster and with better functionality such as decoding, then you want to go to a signal, I think, at the very least. Like the SDS1104XE. If you can stretch that far, then get one in. Johnny, whiskey and express equals expensive. Uh, potentially, yeah. Has anyone actually heard from Chris, all the gear, no idea? What can I say? All the gear, no idea. Um, I haven't heard from him for ages. He hasn't done any videos for a few months. I sent him a message on Twitter. Um, early last week and no response to Dan, that's not unusual, he doesn't tend to use Twitter that much so I'm not sure he's you know, just really busy because he's going to have to go back to work I don't know, but um, yeah, that's why I've been on search for him <laughs> oh, email. it's probably YouTube team I'm live Yes, it is. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So this obviously this coding thing is like for, right in front of my mind right now, and I want to get that working. And it'd be really nice to have something I can use on Mac. You know, I mean, sure, I'm going to get a PC laptop out. You know, the mother homes to keep a PC laptop in there. Um, and I'll go and get that. The battery's knack on it, so you have to have plugged in all the time. But um, I could use that, but I don't want to have a second computer. I use a Mac, I'm a Mac user, so I want to build the software and make it do what I want as well. Yeah, it's true actually, Johnny. If you use the cheapest freight, it will be around Christmas time when it arrives. If it arrives, so yeah, if you get yourself a Christmas present, drink, drunk buying on AliExpress. <laughs> of course, because it's so long as well, you, you did buy it and you knew what you were buying at the time. In a couple of months' time, you'd have completely forgotten about it, so it's still going to be a surprise. At least it will be for me. Um, Andre, what I've found is if you... I, mean, I don't think you need those like, really high-end soldering stations. I mean, it's not that nice to have if you can afford to get one. Um... I know they, you know, they are quality, and you are getting what you're buying for. But the one I've reviewed recently is that uh, Jabe UD twelve hundred. I did a review on it. Well, it must be about two months ago now. Actually, I've been locked down for two months. Must have before that, maybe three, maybe three months. Um, this is on, this is on my desk now. So I did have the KSGR T twelve station, which did me well for a couple of years, and then I picked up this Jabe to do a review on and that is now on bench to replace the KSGR and that is super fast heat up times um, uses the C245 tips um, same as the JBC so um, you can use JBC tips on it so you can buy high quality tips and put them on it if that worries you um, but I've been really happy with that sold installation so far it works really well so that's what I'd recommend it's a bit cheaper But it's, it's under different brands as well. As, um, so this one's a Jabe, J-A-B-E. 
there's also another brand I can't think it was now there's another brand name but it's exactly the same station just a different name on it but um, yeah I've actually found myself a couple of times now wanting more than four channels on the oscilloscopes so yeah but then you know sometimes I'm doing kind of complex stuff sometimes if I get it working I'm going to pull the extra editions from the 3457A yeah well I've got that other GPIB stuff um, I've got that um, I have actually had that multimeter giving readings back using your software Ian um, was it yours? Yeah, it was your software, wasn't it? I was using it, yeah, that's right. Um, I was using that to send commands to it and get readings back from it, and that was working, and I was, I was doing some logging with it and you know, graphing it out. So I did actually have that working, um, but again, that all relied on having a PC here, so I do want to get it working on Mac. If I can get it to sending Skippy commands or any kind of raw data across the bloody thing, I can get it working, but yeah. I mean, my, my my focus right now is getting working on the signal gear, um, and then I'll, as you know, maybe over time I can add more things to it, you know, more general purpose things. But um, I mean, I think seeing these skippy commands is pretty general purpose. Lots of things use those, but I have to look at some way of doing that. Um, I got the logic analyzer version of the S1054. Um, okay, right. I'm not too familiar with the Rogol stuff. Um. LC displays which are four levels of analog. Well, what you could potentially do is hook up two channels at the same time. So you've got two channels going to each data line, and then you can set the thresholds for each channel to be different if you're able to do that. And then that could give you then the, the four states potentially. Well, at least you'd get three states out of it, wouldn't you? You get three states out of it. So that's maybe a workaround. It won't be very easy to read, but you know. Could tell you something, maybe. So yes, when analog comes in really handy. I mean, I've got the um, STS two thousand X Plus, which I won from that contest that Signal did not long ago. Over the past couple of years, they're doing a lot of big long. Was it one year? One year, wasn't it? Promotion I did in one of a few videos. I submitted one net scope, which was brilliant. Um, those of you around at the time wouldn't know that. <coughs> I've also got the SDS 1104 XE, which is also four channel, which I purchased um, about a year ago. And then I've also got the Keysight, which is only two channel, which is the DSOX 1102G. And I've also got my SDS 2000, which has got the MSO option on it as well. That's out on the other lab. Um, I've also got a analog scope up there, oh, Dick Smith Electronics 60 megahertz analog scope sitting up there. Haven't turned it on for about five years, so I should probably get it down and turn it on so it goes bang. Also my Tetronics um, 2432A, four channel. Four channel? Yeah, it was four channel 300 megahertz scope in the garage. But that's a bit clunky. Um, it worked fine, but yeah, I had to repair it a couple of times. That's the thing on top of some stuff over there, it's not actually being used. Um, hmm. Anyway, alright, so back to what I was talking about this thing here on the desk, which is one of the things I'm going to look at. I want that one on the desk. Let's do this one. So, so that power supply is a standard power supply brick, you know. 240 volts down to 12 volts. 
uh, 4.1 amps or something like it was. That's what it's rated for. So that has actually kind of failed. It is outputting voltage. And the device it's used with was half working, which is really interesting because what it was doing. Um, let's do that one. Um, yeah, that's about that. So the it's a magic TV box, right? So it's like a digital TV tuner with a hard drive built into it for doing recording, right? So you record your TV programs and play them back later on. Quite a common thing. Now, it was apparently this wasn't actually my device; it belonged to my in-laws, um, and apparently it was sometimes. It wouldn't turn on properly, you have to turn it on, turn it back off again, turn it back on, then it'll work. Um, or the more recently it was just not work at all, but it was also doing things like giving a hard drive failure. So when I got it here and started testing it, it was saying hard drive had failed. I was like, well, that's interesting. Put another hard drive in, and also said hard drive had failed. Thinking, well, this hard drive is not right, and I want to test it with it's not good, but it's a faulty hard drive, but it still worked. I so think that's interesting. So I noticed that the circuit board had some less than perfect solder joints on it on the hard drive connector. It's a SATA connector. So I pulled the board out, resoldered the joints, put it back in again, no different. Um, so I thought, okay, let's look a bit deeper. Let's swap out the power supply. Easy thing to do is swap out the power supply. I mean, this thing's uh, five, six years old, something like that, this device. And these things are on all the time, right? So the power brick's always on. So I thought, right, likely to be a power supply problem as well. So I swapped the power supply out and it worked fine after that. So I was like, okay, that's what the brick's right there for. So the brick is half working. It is outputting enough to turn the magic TV box on and run through the system and you go through the menus and that sort of stuff and do all that. And it was working, but it wasn't enough power to run a hard drive. So I thought it was quite interesting. Almost did a video on it, almost. Actually, there's a few things I just should have done videos on recently. I've done a few repairs over the past couple of days. My range hood died again. That um, died yesterday. I fixed that yesterday. I should have done a video on that. It would have been a little bit interesting. I should have done, but I just want to get the thing fixed. Um, that Magic TV box thing with the remote control, which is also really bad. The remote control was really glitchy. Um, I fixed that as well, and there was something else. Come on, something else I fixed as well. Um, yeah, but I didn't do any videos. <laughs> bubblings in your head, no one. No one's. Your, your bubblings in your head. No, it's my NAS. My NAS sits on my desk here behind my computer screen. And um, it's do it's doing a backup right now, so you can hear it clicking away. It's actually quieter than it used to be. I've got it on side on sort of some rubber mats, stuff like that, so it's actually trying to reduce the noise. And yeah, that's why it's behind the monitor to try and get the noise down. The helps block some of it. Hmm. Yes, anyway. So, so what I was planning on doing, SSDs, no, it's hard drives. It's uh, the, um, it's got three, what are they? 10 terabyte drives, something like that in there. I think there's three 10 terabyte drives, or eight terabyte drives, something like that. I think they're eight. So, yeah. So, anyway, what I'm planning on doing with this power supply is. I'm going to make a cable up, we'll put it on my electronic load, we'll power the thing up, we'll load test it and see how it handles the loading. I've already opened it up, so I know what's wrong with the power supply, at least visually. I haven't done any physical tests, just looked at it. Um, so I'll do that, load it up, put it apart, make sure we don't zap ourselves the charge capacitor, which is 400 volts or whatever that is, 350 odd volts, whatever it is. Um, much with this charge out before we touch anything. 
and repair it and reload test it afterwards and see what the difference is. I thought we'd do that. Could be interesting. Repairing a power supply. When these little bricks they fail quite often, you know, well, often, but they're prone to it because of the nature of the design being an enclosed plastic block. Plastics don't transfer heat very well. They're quite heat resistant. Um, there's a word for it. I can't think what it is. Anyway, transmissive heat transmission. I can't think what it is. Thermal something rather. Anyway, um, so yeah, the heat gets blocked in. Also, there is usually like a, a aluminium heat sink inside. And because it's all really compact, it tends to be quite close to capacitors and all that, and things get hot and cook. Um, film dissipation is for transmission of heat. I'm talking about heat passing through the material. I don't think it's thermal dissipation, something else. Um, yeah, so they naturally they will fail after a period of time because they just. That's what they do. Thermal conductivity, that's the one. Thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, so plastics resist thermal conductivity, so they actually transfer heat through them very well. They're a good insulator. So trying to get heat out of the block isn't great. Um, anyway, so they commonly do fail. I've repaired some in the past, but sometimes when they've blown up, they've been a catastrophic event so it's like burnt charred circuit board kind of thing so it's like meh. so I've had a couple like that so I've just tended not to bother too much but this is a 4 amp power supply so you know it might be worth fixing so um, there's actually a trick to get into these things as well because when you got these welded cases they're ultrasonically welded together so you've got two half shells which are come together and ultrasonic weld them what they basically do is they have a jig which holds it and then they've got an ultrasonic horn and it holds the other half and it just vibrates very slightly and rubs them together and that really fast rubbing obviously causes friction which is causing heat which is what melts them together so usually you can actually break them apart without cutting them sometimes you have to cut them because they're really well done um, depends how well welded they are um, but often you can go around them and you can tap the outside right by the join hit right by the join and it'll actually crack the world and you just take your case apart did you hear about your fire? No, I didn't hear about your fire, Ian. What happened to that? Go on, Ian, you better tell me now. David, transmissivity. Yes, the word I can't pronounce very well, so I can't say it. <laughs> Yeah, come on in, Ian. Fill me in. I haven't heard about this. Fill us all in. Just see about your fire. Hope it wasn't too serious. Yeah, nobody wants to have fires. I was outside. That's good. You're charging a streamer battery. Two five thousand amp hour, sorry, five amp hour batteries. Three foot flames. Wow. So we've got a little electric strimmer. I'm not sure batteries are on it actually. Um, the wife uses that. She likes to do the, the edges. That's something one thing she likes to do. Keep the garden a bit nicer looking. And. Um, we charge that in the garage. I've got a metal filing cabinet in there, and where a lot of tools and stuff are, and the charge is on top of that. So there's nothing directly around it, it's on top of a metal filing cabinet. It's probably two metres to the roof. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's a bit scary. No things catch me fire, aren't you? My cat's awake. Let's get the cat. Hey George. So here's George. She loves cuddles. Oh, well, she also wants to get down. She doesn't like being picked up that much. Yeah. 
We'll just go for Cam here. Oh, yeah, she noticed it's getting hot. Well, that was lucky then, wasn't it? That was a close call. Well, if you hadn't been there, a lot of times, like my cordless drill, for example, I've got a charger right there, got two batteries for the cordless drill. So I will um, have one on the drill, one on charge. And often I've used it, I'll charge it up. And I'll just chuck the thing on a charger, walk away, and forget about it. And a week later, I go and turn it off. George is a female cat. Apparently gingers are rare in females. Most gingers are male, apparently. Yeah. She's rubbing herself on everything now. She's probably gonna start typing in a minute. Yeah, it's definitely a good call to take the battery outside. Go on, George, get down. Right, so let's have a play with this thing. So I'm going to make a cable up. And we'll get that working. I want to do a video on it as well. Record a video repairing it. So I need to try and remember not to, you know. Oh, my control's out in the garage still. Left it out there. Makes things a bit more tedious. It's okay. Um, I've actually purchased a second one. So. If I leave it out there, I've got one here still. Hasn't arrived yet. So yeah, let's make a cable up for this thing. Then we'll hook up to the signal load. And we'll do some load testing. So I've already got a connector here. So I've got a connector that's there, which plugs on. It's a standard 2.1mm DC jack. And um, I'll stick some wires on this and we'll hook it up to the load and we'll test it. Get some wire. Let's create a draw and get some wire. And four amps potentially. Mm. Well, let me see. This might do. Alright, oh, I've got this cable here, I use this. So I've clips onto the front panel, soldered these wires onto the plug. I mean the smallest thing on here is going to be connected on this plug anyway, with this socket, so and we'll do it that way. So I'll make this cable up first, then we'll start doing the video on this. Massive wires on this thing, I'm not sure what gauge they are. You know, I've got a 10 gauge or something, like a 10 gauge. Quite big for what I'm doing here. This copper is a bit old, so it may not solder too well. Of course, I could turn the heat out of my mind, but uh, I was a bit more patient. Don't get it too hot. Okay. 
Now I found out on these connectors, you know, traditionally, well, quite often the positive lead is the longer one. You know, like you know, LEDs and stuff like that. The positive lead is the is the longer lead. The on these connectors is the other round. The short one's the positive. <laughs> I found out the hard way the very first time I went to use one, which is why it's now stuck in my mind. The positive is the short one because I assumed. And I made an ass of myself. I shouldn't have assumed that I made a mistake. So, blew up the thing it was connected to at the time. It's one of these projects I was building, so I had to replace part of the supply. It wasn't a big deal, but we preferred not to do it. Anyway, that's the connector on. <clears throat> So I shall get my video feeding in for my camera. Uh, do I have a good light tester? Yes, I've got a good light tester. I've got a Siglent SDL 1020XE. And I've also got a main new um, 8912, is it? Something like that. I've actually got two. Main hour one is the first one I had, then I picked up the Siglent one uh, well, a year or so ago. Let's do HDMI. Don't forget to like and subscribe. some video on this. Today I'm going to fix this power supply brick, well hopefully anyway. We're going to pull it apart, we'll load test it as well, make sure it's working okay, doing all its stuff right, and um, it's right, it's distracted by people talking outside the room. The, um, So I'm going to load test it, we'll see how the output is under load. This is supposed to be 12 volts at 4.16 amps, that's what it's rated for. So, <coughs> oh dear. so we'll load it, test it at 12 volts, hopefully, and see if the voltage drops. Load it up and see how it handles before we repair. We'll try and fix it, and we'll load test it again after that and see how it handles the loading after that point and see if the repair was successful or not. So we'll get stuck into it. Nice. Right. I did that open a little bit, but I could hear people talking outside. So, my in laws are currently staying here. They sold their house and they're moving to Australia. And uh, their flight got cancelled, all the flights got cancelled, so they can't actually get to Australia. So, um, they're living here for the time being until I get a flight. So, yeah, let's get some more lighting actually. I should want some more lighting. Wasn't this small? Make a difference. 
Okay. How's the sound for you guys? Does that sound alright or not? Um, it probably is. It's not looking too bad on the VU meter anyway. Right. So here's a cable I've just hooked up. Well, I've just knocked up. Suppose what's up is, is that the right term? Mm. Looked up has other meanings as well. Anyway, you could be screwed. So we'll plug that in there. You can see bare connections. Not to make sure I don't touch them on anything or short anything out. So there's some crocodile leads here. What I'll do is I'll put these up onto my signal electronic load, and we'll chuck on the load tester, and then we'll see what happens. A little bit of an angle for this thing. Let's turn it to the rear slightly more. Get it a bit more even. It's another reason I want to try and get this software working so I can do things like read these readings straight off the software rather than uh, trying to camera the front panel. A bit wonky, aren't I? These knobs aren't the original knobs, I'll swap those out. But the problem is these have got like a they've got a banana jack in on them. And um, though it's convenient, makes it a bit more usable. Um, the depth of the threads isn't actually enough, so I've actually had to put washers on here to space it out. Otherwise you can't actually crack down clamp down hard enough and like a spade connector. Spade terminal you can't get onto it properly. So I don't know what these are going to be for high current, but uh, it's 4 amps high current, is it? It's why it's tangled up. Anyway. Uh, so, voltage range 36 volts, fine. 5 amp range, that's enough. That should be good. Constant current mode. Um, yeah, what kind of am I going to put on this thing? Good question, actually. What kind of am I going to use? Um, no, I'm going to use it. So I've used it a little while. Go on, Scott. Remember to use it. So look like an idiot. That's right. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. No, no, no. it's right in front of me. One amp. I don't want to do one amp straight away. Uh, actually, I'll come down over here. I'll start quite low. I'll do 100 milliamps first and go up. Okay. Check, check, then I'll start doing this. Pause electronics, says the guy. I've seen you here before. Finish your stream, did you? You stream as well, do you? Excellent. The 
make, making AliExpress electronic loads now. Okay, the electronic load I've got from AliExpress. Hold on, let me just change cameras. Uh, this is the one I bought from AliExpress, right? Oh, how did I buy this? Probably must be three, four years ago. This one here. May now. So nine seven one two M nine seven one two. Right? You see that right? Let's wave it. Okay. So this is a three hundred watt electronic load. There are different versions, can do different voltages, different powers. Um, this one's does three hundred watts at thirty amps max. There is one which can do sixty amps max, but a lower voltage rating, something like that, I think it was. So it's different variants. Um, and I actually did a post on the AliExpress, oh, AliExpress forum, <laughs> e, the EV blog forum about calibrating these things because I had an issue with the calibration. So it wasn't quite as accurate as I wanted. It was pretty close. It was not much out of it. And I did some information about how to calibrate these things. I figured that out. Because there was already some information online about how to calibrate them. You got the nine eight one one, yeah. Okay. Change back to that. Right, let's power this thing up. Right, power supply is doing twelve point four volts and there's no load on it right now, and you can see it's a little bit unstable. Let's turn the load on. So drawing 100 milliamps, it's dropped down very slightly, but and as I see, it's not very stable. It's jumping around quite a bit. So let's increase the current. You notice that little glitch on here? Like this little bug that the software's got on this thing. It will actually jump over. When you turn the load on, it will jump from the digit you got selected to the end digit. You have to come back over and bring it back on again. So that's 200 milliamps. If you're still here, I might maybe want to report that one. Um, then 12.2 now. 300 milliamps, 12 volts, 400, 11.8. 500 milliamps, 11.6. Up to 1 amp. This claps right down. Look at that, 1 amp is doing 9.7 volts or so. 1.5 amps, 7.7 .7 volts, 2 amps. 6.3, 2.5 amps, 6.5, 3 amps, 6.5 still, so it seems to like it's clamped to the 6.5 or so. But there's a really good chance what this has got is a huge amount of ripple. So, yeah. The 2 amps is only half the rating of the power supply, and it's down at 8.6 watts here, so pretty bad. Get the one amp, eleven volts. That's pretty bad. So that's why it's not performing like it should. Yep, let's drop down to 1.4 volts now. It's gradually discharging. Turn the load back on. Yep. Okay. It's bouncing back up. <laughs> so. I'm not sure. No, maybe not. Okay. So I've already opened this casing up because I was investigating it yesterday. 
I'm going to show you how to get into these things. Now there's different techniques. One way is to cut the casing. I don't recommend that as a first choice. The way which will often work is you get a little hammer. I've got a few of these little hammers, different types. You may have seen those in my mailbags recently. What you can actually do is go around and just tap on the join. Right? Just tap the join. All the way around. And sometimes you have to do it quite hard. Um, sometimes you can flex them, you can actually push on the sides, depending if there's much clearance of the sides, you can actually flex things and it will also help break them. And once you get a corner starting to move, you can get a spudger in there. Let's get a spudger. And you can get in there and just open it up a little bit. Right? Try to get lighting on it so you can see. You get it opened up. Now sometimes you might find one corner is moving, the other corners will not budge. That happens. What I found is a good way to get that get that close to the corner or halfway down, something like that, like that. And then you squeeze this side, and that then pops that one open. That helps as well. Um, anyway, this is open already. I've already done that. I've gone through that task. I wanted to show you how to do it. Now, a bit of a disclaimer: when you're dealing with these power supplies, they can hold voltage in them. Right? There's a big capacitor in here, and it potentially could be 350 volts on that capacitor. So, don't touch anything until you're sure the capacitor is discharged. And it's safe to touch, right? Because it could be one of these heat sinks could even be live. Sometimes the heat sinks could be live, you don't know. I've seen things like that in the past where heat sinks have been live. So before we touch anything in here, we're gonna pop it out and see if that capacitor is discharged and see if we're safe. Because you don't want to zap yourself, it will give you quite a jolt if you're not careful. Jet. What does a power brick weigh? Um, not much. I don't know. Maybe, I guess, a quarter of a kilo. Maybe. I don't know. I'm just guessing there. Um, have an axiom at 150 watt 30 amp 150 volt yeah there's lots of different loads out there some are quite good you can also get these other cheaper loads off-brand ones you know um, yeah AliExpress suggests the HP 8143B for only 27 grand <laughs> Well, okay. Oh, that's my room. Yeah. Oh, someone lost someone with the big clive. Oh, thanks, Ian. Much more engaging. Yeah. I hope so. I mean, big clive's right if you want to have a chat and just communicate with someone. I try and do more technical things, I suppose. 20 kilowatt electron load. Wow, it's huge. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Catch you later. Yeah, that's right, Johnny. Have to be careful with them. Digital stump. Going to build a power supply. Ham shack. We're going to use a 200 horsepower server power supply. A 2 HP, not horsepower. 2 HP server power supplies. 12 volt 60 amps. Uh, yeah, diodes should be fine, I'd imagine. You might get a bit of heat dissipation, though. I mean, I don't know, it's just power supplies that might be able to handle being in parallel, I don't know. Hey, ARV block, as again. In house of moth. Um, I don't know, you might be able to just parallel them up, but it depends on what the outputs are designed for. Um, if you have a 
if you think about MOSFETs, right? it could be a MOSFET output, I've got no idea, but MOSFETs can be powered all up. But what you have to do to ensure that you don't have an issue with them fighting each other is you have a resistor on the outputs or whatever um, to help balance them so they're not actually directly connected together. You have a resistor between them, so really small value like 0.1 ohms or less, um, something really small, just so they're not directly connected together. I mean, it might be the same case those power supplies might have to have some kind of isolation there by way of a big resistor. But I don't know if that's really going to be necessary. I mean, I'd imagine as long as you get the voltage output set to be basically identical, you might find it will be fine anyway. They won't really fight each other because any loading will just pull the highest one down more, and then the other one will be equalising. So it may not actually matter. I mean, they should be isolated from each other anyway. It should be my mains isolated anyway because they'll be switching supplies, I expect. Um, so it shouldn't really be a problem. Just make sure you get the connectors correct. It could be a big bang. Right. Let's get back to this. Alright, so lift this thing out and check for it being dead. Come on, pop out. So, where's that big capacitor? It's over here. There's also a broken lead on a capacitor 4.7 volts. Check this out. Just notice that. See that? It's got a broken, broken lead. <laughs> More than one fault. So we'll have to fix that as well. So we're only down at like 4 volts, so we should be fine. 4.7 volts on that one. Now the other capacitors on this end here. So let's just measure those to make sure they're definitely dead. Nothing there. Okay, we're safe. Right. Because when you're converting a, in my case, 240 volt power supply down to DC, because that's what this is doing, is rectifying and changing the DC, then it actually increases the, because it's RMS value, so you're over 300 volts, um, and that gives you quite a zap. So we'll fix that capacitor maybe, I'm not sure if that capacitor is even any good. If you discharge it, um, let's do it the hacky way and just short it out. I was thinking I could restart that leg, but then I may or may not need to replace this capacitor. Let's give it a long time to get a chance to discharge. Because they do have like a memory effect. And let's measure that capacitance. I'm just going to use my bench meter. You won't be able to see it. I'll tell you what it is. Fixing on my hertz. This is saying about 27 microfarad dissipation of 100 ESR 5 kilo ohms. Hmm. I think that might be a little bit excessive. That count could be gone as well. I'm not sure I've got something the same though. And it's 
Silica oh, gel in there. Uh, I'll leave it out. That's going to be interesting. No, we'll do so anyway. Check the chain again. You can connect the current shape ins to the PSU together. Okay. You're taught to discharge capacitor seven times. Yeah, because what well, is capacitors have memory effect because it is a capacitor. What happens is you'll discharge it and then you actually watch the voltage and it'll gradually come back. And then we'll discharge it again and then it'll come back and discharge it again and it'll come back. That's what they do. So that's why LV blog is saying about um, discharging it multiple times because it does come back. It's like self healing sort of thing. So I'm going to take that capacitor out as well. Let's pull this out a bit. Right, so let's take this big cap out as well. So it looks like that's probably a bit fried. And let's find out what the thing is at the very least. And I'm going to try and hook that out of there somehow. Because it is got elastic holding it down. Um, I'm trying to get my ears under there somehow. Yeah, it's starting to lift up. Something's going anyway. That's also bulging, yep, it's got a bulge in it. Okay. So you can see there it's also got a slight bulge in the top, so yep, definitely gone. What we're dealing with here. Okay. 100 microfarad, 400 volt. Let's see if we've got something similar. Look at that, got Rubicon, how's that? 120 microfarad. Hmm. Don't want to go too much of value. All the same. Okay. Hey, George. So first of all, we'll reinstall this capacitor here. So it's a 400 microfarad, 120, sorry, 400 volt, 120 microfarad. Drop this in. It's a Rubicon brandy one, so 105 degree rated, that sort of stuff, so it's still good specs. And I will actually end up gunking this thing down some way to hold it in place nicer. For now, we'll just get it soldered in. It. We sold that leg. They should now hold it in place. We'll do the other one. So one capacitor done. That will make a difference for a start. But that's not the only problem. Don't forget to click like. Oh God, I can't say. Don't forget to click like and subscribe. Now over here we've got three more capacitors, and you can see those are also bulged. They are all going to be bad as well. So those have all got to come out. Okay. 
we get the cat out of the way, we can stand up. Right, let's check. Okay. <clears throat> so let's take these other caps out. I think they're all the same. It's all in parallel with each other, so it doesn't actually matter. through solder as well, it's looking a bit like it. I think the joint over here is looking a bit dodgy as well, I might look at that one. I might have to put some fresh solder on these ones get these ones out, we'll see. Yeah, put some fresh solder on, it's struggling a little bit. I might just do that. This one here as well. Didn't do solder copy either. These are all synastic in as well. So we'll try and get that out. And it's nice I do that to help reinforce them, but it does make it a bit harder when you've got to try and get the things out. Okay. Come on. First one's coming. First one, so they're all in parallel anyway, so it doesn't really matter about values, but I think they're all the same value anyway. Okay. So what are these things? 1000 microfarad, 16 volt. And yeah, all the same, as expected. So I've just got to find something I can put in there. Right. 1000 microfarad. Got some 25 volt. We've got some 16s. This is 16. Same physical size. Another 16. Another 16. Here we go. Now I could upgrade them to 25 volt. But if I've got devices which are the same physical size, I'd rather get rid of my smaller stock. You know, there's. Um, the smaller ones and keep the stock of the larger voltage version for the same physical size. Pop those in. Obviously check polarity. <laughs> kind of important. Physically they still fit, that's important. Now because it's right next to this heatsink, what I'm going to try and do is actually when I solder them in is try and lean them away from it just a little bit. Try and get some more spacing away from the heatsink to try and minimise the direct heat into the capacitors. Same way as I did on this one here, I actually shifted it down very slightly to get that end away from the, the heatsink very slightly. So that's the plan. If it works, I don't know. That's the plan.
Death Farm's capacitor exchange. <laughs> yes, replacing capacitors is a big part of what I do. Rick roll. Right. Yes, I'm up in a can. No, it's not a beer. So you can see the capacitor here, you can see it's bulging on the top. A bulging capacitor is like a dead giveaway, it's definitely bad. It's the simplest way of determining a capacitor is bad is by looking at it. Because if you see a bulge, you're definitely going to be replacing it. But no bulge does not mean that a capacitor is still okay. A no bulging could be a sign that it's leaked at the other end. You know, or it could just be dried out, not exploding. You know, it happens too. So. I do actually keep meaning to do like a video series of um, diagnostics repair stuff. I, I, I kind of want to do something like a tutorial kind of thing. So yeah, I don't know. I think I'll think about that. But um, that is my plan. Is to do that and actually have a like a bit of a teaching series, I suppose, of how to diagnose things and what things to look for. So, uh, it's definitely in my head the same I want to do. Teach you how to check out things and diagnose what's wrong. I'm just pushing the capacitors down and getting them lined up where I want. Did I get them straight? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> I'm probably just being too fussy, but anyway. That's those. Sold the other side up. Just be awkwardly trying not to get me by the camera this time. So you've got some resistors across the output here as well. Well, resistor positions, there aren't any resistors installed. Because I realised I didn't really need them. I can only really solder these joints because I'm not comfortable these are okay. This looks a little bit dodgy. Even one of the bridge rectifiers looking a little bit dodgy as well. Might as well do these two. Might need a little heat for my iron. Just freshen them up slightly. I'm not, you know, if you want to do it properly, really, you clean off the old stuff and put new stuff on. But I'm lazy. I think with F3 sold it does, sometimes it will look like a bad joint when it actually isn't, but then also it could be a joint which is on the way out. Even the ones on the AC input jack look a bit dodgy. Usually physical things, you know, where it's got like a bit of a point where it's got a physical stress on it, the joints tend to crack more easily with lead free. Just don't have the same level of robustness. 
these joints look really bad now. I think I've worked clean those ones off. I'm gonna undo what I just said about these ones. I mean, it's not exactly hard when you've got dissolving them. I'm not going about the other ones. Don't look as bad. Right. We'll clean the flux off and we'll put it back together. Brush is a bit harsh for this. Let's get you on. Right, I'll do it. Good enough. Check for shorts. Bridges, that kind of stuff. Because I screwed something up. Looks fine. I'll check the chat again. I need to gunk these down first, don't I? Uh, issues of stuff. This will be fine. Not a little capacitor is there, it's nice that. Eh? But it's right. Do you think I should change that one too? I probably should. I probably should change that little capacitor too. that cap. I think I should change that one as well since it's right next to the heat sink and it's the last literal so I might as well just do it. Where's this thing? They put gunk on it. Just 
Samsung brand anyway. Uh, 50 volt something. Because oh. I've got the gunk on it, it's slightly dissolved with 30 text. Of course it is. I'll try and read it. Twenty-two mile ferry. Yep, twenty-two mile ferry. This is the place anyway. I've probably got one. Thirty-five volt. It says fifty, so I'm on a fifty volt. Sixty-three. I'll do. It. So as I was gunking in this capacitor here, I realised there's another capacitor just down here next to it. So I'm replacing that one, and that's a uh, 22 microfarad 50 volt. I'm putting a 63 in, so we'll do that. That way, all the capac capacitors are done, and we don't have to worry about it. It's just finished. It's as good as new, hopefully. I'm going to try and lean this one away from the heatsink as well to give it a bit more life. Lean it away like that. Oops. I'll solder this in and I'll come back. Okay, I'm not going to glue it back together yet, I'm going to test it first. Shall I test these capacitors just to prove they're all definitely bad? I think I should do, shouldn't I? Other meter out so I can do it off screen. <clears throat> He's got rubber feet on this thing, always wants to slide around. Do something about that. Let's test these capacitors to prove they're bad before we do the testing of the power supply, make sure it's fixed. So, this is the. What size is that one again? That's 100 microfarad, 400 volt. And we're getting 4.3 picofarad. Oh, one frequency to change to 100 hertz. 38 picofarad, dissipation 2.7. So, definitely bad. Next one. This is 1000 microfarad. Getting 107. Dissipation of 0.9. Definitely bad. 
I mean, these are bulging, so we're not different it anyway, but it's just interesting to see what the actual results are of the tests. 50 microfarad dissipation of 1. We said microfarad dissipation of one. And last one, which we haven't tested yet, and it may even still be okay, we don't know. I just want to replace it. 20 microfarad dissipation 0 0.07. This is 22 microfarad. So it's actually looking pretty close. Let's do ESR. 5.8 ohms. Probably alright still. That one's probably not too bad. Maybe slightly weak. But anyway, it's brand new now, so it's all good. Then we'll come back to the chat. Got the potentially short circuited middle things out of the way. Drop it in the, in, the, in the freezer to make it a bit more. Yeah, okay. Um, that's not a bad idea, in our Bob. Um, yeah, because what is plastics, they go more brittle with temperature. They're very temperature sensitive, or generally, depends on the plastic. But um, they do go um, more brittle. So making them easier to open that way would indeed be true. Yeah, yeah. So I found pretty good results by smacking them. So it does tend to work. There's been a few times that the welding has been so good on them that even it hasn't done the job. Well, I've had to cut them open. But usually what you can do is get a knife blade down the edge and start to separate where the weld is. And once it starts to go, it'll unzip. Um, but yeah, generally hitting them will work. Just needs an impact. And it just means that because the weakest point is usually where the weld is, that's where the fracture point is. Usually, but not always. Depends on how well old it is. Mm. Anyway, let's get back to testing this. <clears throat> Going up. So, moment of truth, let's retest it. So I'm going to wind the current back down again. Again, it did a jumping over. Kind of annoying. Wish it didn't do that. I'll start 100 milliamps and we'll wind it back up again, like I did before. Turn the power on. Hopefully, you get 12 volts, it doesn't go bang. Okay, we've got 12 volts and it didn't go bang. That's a good start. And you can already see this voltage is much more stable than it was before. Before it's jumping around a lot more. So we'll turn the load on, 12.39, that's looking fine, let's wind it up, it's going to jump over, yes it does, half an amp, 12.3, one amp, 12.2, 12.5, 12 12.1, that's looking much better, two amps is 12 volts, two and a half is still 12 volts, three, 11.9, that's acceptable. Well, I think I'm going to get some drop through these leads, don't forget, these aren't perfect, you know, these connections aren't wonderful. So we'll get some drop through those potentially, once you get to these higher currents. 4 amps, 11.7, that looks absolutely fine. So I want it down to say 3 amps, and let's leave it running 3 amps a little bit. We have a low test on it and see how it handles it. If 
for a longer period of time. But that's looking promising. 11.3 volts, uh, 11.9 volts at 3 amps. That's looking fine. Let's do some surges. It's looking alright. If you want, we can look at the actual um, dash one here. I think my cat wants to get out. So on here we can actually monitor the voltage and see how it's handling it with the load. Just a bit of a ripple there. But it's looking fine. Keep it loaded for a little bit, see what happens. George, move on. Okay. Then there were scopes, yes. Um. Okay, and thanks for dropping by. So, so yes, it's working, and it's holding three amps just fine. So that's good. No real heat coming out of it yet. Seems fine. So it's like it's repaired. So it's been on for now for a couple more minutes. Maybe. Maybe a couple of minutes. And it's still holding just fine. No issues with it dropping off. The actual block itself doesn't feel hot. I can't feel any heat coming out of it yet. So it's not like it's struggling too much or anything like that. So I'm pretty confident now I can glue this thing shut again. And put that back in the service. So that's excellent. I'll turn it off the output, it's still showing 12 volts, so it's actually holding voltage. So those capacitors are in there, sorry, those resistor locations which were unpopulated obviously stop the output from dropping because they're supposed to be loading the output capacitors. So I'll just turn the load on to shut that off. Yeah, it's drained them now. Okay. Yeah, it's looking fine. So that's a nice successful repair. That's always good to have. Don't forget to click like and subscribe. And I'll catch you next video. Bye. Okay, how's that job done? Let's glue the thing together. Um, glue, glue. Glue may or may not work, guess we'll find out. Of course, if I have to open this up again in the future, I'm going to have a problem because it's going to be really well shut.
but then you don't want to you want a uh, an AC plug pack well these bricks coming open on you do you you don't really want it to open up when it's still plugged in so having it hard to open is probably a good thing Heavy glue wrapping tape. Yeah, I mean wrapping with tape's okay, but I'd rather just seal it up. I mean this thing's lasted five years. If I get another five years out of it, it's worth the investment in caps. So uh, black silicon, yeah, okay, yes, that's also an option. Um Yeah, I just I'm not really too worried. I mean if if I have to cut it open next time I have to cut it open, you know, if, if the glue doesn't let go. I mean that glue is it's nail glue, it's for doing nails. I need it off my wife, she bought some from a two dollar shop or something and um, I need it from her so um, yeah I don't, know how, I don't know if it's actually super glue or if it's a fake super glue or it, maybe it's not that good I don't know but if I ever repair that power supply again I guess I'll find out but I mean I put some decent brown caps in there, put some Nichigons in there, was it Rubicon, Nichigons and like so you know We'll see how they last. Maybe better than the originals. I mean, there's been times when I've, I've taped them up. I just put bothered gluing them up. Um, what they use for moving is it acetone. We use acetone for a move to break it down. So I think acetone will break down super glue. But also it breaks down the plastic. So. You know, <laughs> and that she know, yeah, she gave me it, so she knows full well that I've got that stuff. <laughs> she bought a few packets of it, and I grabbed a couple of packets off her. Quite a handy thing. So, right. Well, that's good to actually achieve what I wanted to do. That's fix that power supply, recorded some video showing it, showed you guys live, um, and I didn't zap myself. That's always a bonus, not zapping yourself on a charger capacitor. Never done that. Yes. Acetone bleach case, yeah, it probably would do too, actually. Yeah, it does tend to eat into the plastic, so it dissolves plastic. It depends on the plastic, of course, but some plastics don't really bother it. So, well, some plastics aren't bothered by it, but some really don't like acetone. So that is good. That's that job fixed. So, I'll lift the microscope on. Hold on. So, Block yours, that's weird. Um, got zapped by a cap last night when fixing a battery charger for the vault. Yeah, it hurts, eh? It's amazing how much energy is inside those capacitors. After he got zapped, he checked it and so he did it in the wrong order. He checked the voltage before it zapped you. <laughs> that's what he did wrong. <laughs> uh, was that by flash camera cap? Oh, yeah, that's too high voltage too, eh? Uh, never actually had to work on one, so I don't know exactly what they do. I don't know much about them, but I do know they do charge up quite a bit. That's what I do know. Yeah. Anyway, so that's good. So we got that power supply fix, so brilliant. Um, so I wish you. I really wish I'd done video yesterday on those other things I'd fixed. I mean, uh, the um, uh, range hood, which I've repaired before. I did a video on that. I, I uh, recapped it. Uh, it was about, it must be two years ago. A year or two ago, probably. Something like that. I 
recamp the power supply. It's basically the whole controller. It's got a microcontroller in there. Two forty volts comes in. It's got a transformer. It's got the relay switching for the the fan and the lighting on it. And um, also, transformer runs the microcontroller, which then reads the, the push buttons on the front panel. And um, the indicators sends indicators voltages down to the front panel as well. And um, last time the capacitors were gone, so I recapped it, and that worked fine for you know a year or so. And I noticed the wife started complaining, I should say, a few months ago that it wasn't working properly and she couldn't turn the other two fans on. So it's got three fans or fan speeds and only the middle one would work. The slowest one and the fastest one wouldn't come on. And yesterday it just went completely. And what was, I noticed it was doing last week is if it had been used, when you turned it off, you go beep because it's got the beep on it for the button pushes. And you hear it sort of just randomly going beep, beep. After you've used it, probably every 30 seconds or so for probably five minutes afterwards, it just do random beeps, which is a bit weird. I think that's strange. So, um, yeah, so yesterday it went completely. It wouldn't even turn on. Um, what it's trying to, you, you know, they push a button, you beep on some of the buttons, and that was it. Nothing would happen. It would light up and it just die instantly. So um, what that actually turned out to be was a bad 78LO5 voltage regulator, which is powering the microcontroller and the relays. It's browning out. So I really wish I'd done a video on it now, actually. It would have been quite interesting. But the power supply, I, was just, I took it apart, stuck the controller on my bench here, bypassed the transformer, obviously, and I ran it off 10 volts. I shoved 10 volts into the circuitry because it's running a regulator anyway. It doesn't matter. So... Put that in there and um, tested the voltages. And I, I, the first thing I did is check the voltage regulator, and the output was still being five volts. It's four point two volts, so it's obviously right on that verge of browning out. And any kind of loading, like the relay is kicking in, it would have actually been dropping it lower than that because obviously the regulator is not coping. So I just replaced that voltage regulator, and it was fine after that, and put it back up there. It's working perfectly again. So. See how long it lasts, and I don't know. I'm surprised the voltage regulator failed. It's, it's a bit unusual. Um, I don't know if that regulator was weak last time as well. I can't remember. It might have been. I'm not sure. But um, if it fails again, I'll change it to be a 7805 7800L05. I'll put the uh, higher current version in and see how that goes. Um, but yeah, easy fix. Didn't take long. But I should have done a uh, video on it. I think it would have been a good video, actually. Because the last one I did, did kind of okay. It was all right. Um, I don't believe this now. Anyway, I'll have to go and look for it. But, yeah, it was kind of okay. Uh, so I think what I'll do today is go back to this and carry on trying to get this software to work. You know, trying to... Remember how to do this bloody software. <laughs> you know, I really want to get this bloody thing working. So I'll get this thing talking to my um, multimeter. Then I could expand from that. You know, get it to talk to it, send commands to it. If I can get it to send commands, and I've got to figure out how to get to read commands or read responses back from the multimeter to get the readings from it. And then I can do the on screen display for doing live streams. Um, and stuff like that, and that'll be good. And have some software to run on the Mac, It'd be great. And then I can then adapt it from that point to be used on like the S the SDL load, so adapt it for that as well. Working on the load, and I'll do another power supply there, the which I really use actually. I hardly ever use it. Um, if I go to just up there on top of my big power supply it's right in the middle of the screen at the very top next to the thermostat uh, thermostat thermometer the um i've got a uh, spd is it 1168 is it something like that. um and I, I picked it up a few years ago and to be honest i think i've only used it once it's, I, I did a review on it and i actually liked it as much as i bought it so 
that's why I've got it because I, I actually like it because it's got a graphing built into it and that sort of stuff. But if I can use that across the software as well, maybe output graphing of the currents and stuff like that from the power supply, that'd be quite nice. Can I can you do some kind of tracking of tests and I've got to do. I mean, you can do it on the unit itself, but I think it's a little bit limited in what I can do on screen versus what I can do from remote logging. So it'd be getting quite nice to work with that as well. Then I could probably do some more automated testing with that sort of stuff. But uh, getting you working on the Mac first is the first priority. Because that's what I need to get going. And I haven't dropped any frames today. That's actually really surprising. Internet's really behaving. Although I haven't seen any chat here for the past five minutes. Has the chat locked up? That happens. Someone say something, see if it pops up. Yeah, here we go. Boo, here we go. That works. Wops the way. You're listening, cool. That's right. As long as it's not frozen up. That has happened in the past. I've been chatting away. I noticed that the chat is frozen. It's actually not updating anymore. That has happened. Do I have? Um, well, I've already fixed it. <laughs> hey, Sheldon. Didn't read you there. Um, yeah, so what I've just repaired was a brick style power supply. That thing there. Just repaired that, pulled it apart. Well, I load tested it, proved it as weak, pulled it apart, replaced the capacitors in it, reload tested it. And um, yeah, but don't worry, I've recorded a video on it, all right? So you won't be missing it completely. As long as you are subscribed to the channel, then you'll see me publish a video on it in the future. I'll do a proper video on it and I've recorded footage. So you better see a fairly short video, I think it will be, I don't think it will be that long, um, of me repairing this power supply, so you haven't really missed it. Of course, you can always rewind and watch it from the beginning, later on or something, or live stream, but um, if you just wait, you'll see the video when I publish it. Uh, still doing repairs from water damage a few years back. Yes, I've still got stuff to do. So, I did a video last week. I think I published it last week, was it? The week before. week before, it might have been. On October 25. Um, is it 25 NWST. That was when I was liquid damaged um, CBs that I had. So, that was one of the ones from that storm. Which I chucked in a box once I, I say I flushed them out of fresh water, dried them out and chucked them in a the box and thought well, I'll get back to them later on. Um, yeah, so I've still got a few to do that. I've got, I don't know, at least half a dozen. Probably more actually. I think I've probably got about maybe 10 radios there. Some are liquid damage, some are just dead. Some aren't liquid damage, they're just broken. So I do have stuff to do there. Um, I'm halfway through doing a video on um, a President HR 2600 ham radio so that's half done but it's being a pain in the butt so that's why it's only half done it's um, I replaced the final transistor on it with a different type which is supposed to be much more robust and I think that one blew up as well which is a bit odd those are pretty solid things so um, and it's also a really expensive transistor so I don't really want to put another one and have it go again because the transistor is worth as much as the radio is so I'm hesitant now with that one but I've got some other radios so I've got another present HR 2510 I've got two of those and a Lincoln to do I've got a Cobra 29 Limited or classic, whatever it is. Um, K 
Cobra 148, uh, Uniden PC 122, um, what else have I got? Emperor 5100, I think it is, or 5010, or whatever it is. Something like that. Yeah, the SRF three seven seven five transistor is expensive. It's almost a shame to put it in the radio. I mean, current prices for them is more than the radio's worth, like you say. But at the time, I didn't pay that for them, so they weren't really much of a cost to me. I think they were about fifty dollars or some of that when I bought them at the time. So still not cheap, but worth the investment to get the radio running. But um, yeah, the fact it blew up. Um, the current spite went pop. Well, it didn't pop, but it just died. The output died. So I, I don't know why it did that. It's very odd. I'm not sure the BIOS circuitry is behaving properly. Maybe it's a problem with that. So I might have to rebuild the BIOS circuitry and just um, then put another one in. I mean, the radio was dead. Actually, still kind of is dead. It's got a couple of problems. I'll explain it. So when I powered the radio up, nothing on the display. So I'll show some diagnostics on that, trying to determine what's causing the display not to come up. So I'll check the reset circuitry. Um, Shogun 5010, yes, yeah, Shogun, I think 5010 is um, same as the Emperor, I think. I think the Emperor 5010 as well. But yeah, it's very, very similar. It's a spin-off. It's, it is different, but you can see the commonality. You can see that the Emperor slash Shogun is based off that chassis. They, they look very similar. Uh, 2510 or 2600 slash Lincoln, they're, they're very similar radios. Um, yeah, so, um, so yeah, the, no, nothing on display when I powered up that 2600. I traced that back to check the reset circuitry. The reset circuitry was working. Normally it's the reset which plays up and that wasn't giving trouble. And I then probed around and found that the resonator, 2 MHz resonator, wasn't working. Um, so that was why the space came. So what I did is I injected my own frequency, my own 2 MHz frequency from my Roland Sport signal generator. And that then brought the display up, and the radio was then functional, mostly. I had to do some other things to it. Um, I think I fully recapped it. Yeah, I did. End up fully recapping it as well, just to try and worm out any other little subtle bugs it had with it. So um, that's what I did there, and I th I was making good progress with it. The only issue I think I had left was the resonator not working. So I actually tried substituting another resonator. Or crystal oscillate, that sort of stuff. Um, but it's the wrong frequency, it wasn't it was a bit high for it, so it wasn't great. But I tried another resonator, that didn't work. So I've actually ordered some more um, from AliExpress. So once I arrive, I'll substitute. But that was when I got to the point where the final then failed. The one I tried to put in, that th SRF 3775, which I'm not happy about. So that kind of made me the bugger. And I just put it away and I just, I just walked off from it. Turn everything up all too often, it's been sitting ever since because I didn't really want to have to deal with replacing those finals. You know, um, now obviously, I've already done the conversion to, to accept that final, but it shouldn't have blown up. Yeah, I've got a 2950, the Ranger RCI, I've got a 2950DX2. That's my bench radio I use in there for doing testing. Audio testing on that, because that's rock solid. Good at radio, that one. Um, yeah, so that's where I'm at with that. But I've also got a prison Lincoln sitting on my desk, which I've also half recorded video for, which is diagnosing a issue that all these radios actually have, or that chassis type have. Is when you turn them on, the display doesn't come up, and you'll do it a few times, and the display will start working. I've seen this so many times over the years, different radios, all the same architecture, you know. 
um, Lincolns, 2510s, whatever. They all seem to do it, where they have an issue with the display not coming up straight away. So I'm actually working on that right now. So I've actually modified the reset circuitry very slightly on that radio, because this one was really bad for it. You leave it off a couple of weeks, and you, you, would, you turn it on, nothing. Turn it on, nothing. Turn it on, nothing. Turn it on, nothing. Turn it on, oh, there we go. Then after that, it's okay. So I did some oscilloscope probing on the reset circuitry, the whole entire reset circuit, and I grabbed some screen grabs from that. So I got a record of them, recorded video about the whole process, and then I've modified the reset circuitry very slightly to do what I think is a correction for that. I've now left the radio off for about a month. Um, believe it or not, it actually matters. So, left it off for about a month, and when I go back to retest it, I'm going to hook it to scope up and then reprobe it and see if I fix the problem or not. But I'm not 100% sure that the problem is the reset circuit. It could be the resonator as well. It could be that part is not great either. It could be that what's wrong with them. But I'll start off with the reset circuitry and see if I can resolve that. Because I'm, I'm seeing this problem over and over again. I'd like to get to the bottom of what causes it. But I'm just working around and turning the radio on off several times, you know. So yeah, so I've been playing with radio stuff. I mean, I've had two months off, so um, because of the COVID thing and being locked down, um, there's a boundary between where I live and where I work. So in it's around the Auckland city of Auckland, I suppose, there's a boundary on the outskirts which denotes the Auckland region, and I live outside of that boundary, and so I can't actually get to work. Even though my company is running, they're operating. I can't get there. So, um, yeah, so I can't get to work right now. Thankfully, I'm still being paid. That's good. At least at the moment. But um, who knows how long that will continue on for. So hopefully the boundary disappears soon, because I'd really love to go to work. But in that two months, I've done a few projects and fixed a few things. been meaning to get done. I've also wasted so much time. I've just been sort of sitting around, just relaxing, doing that so much. Um... I've been wasting so much time now. Roger Bird, yeah, I don't even, if, don't even know if Roger Bird's still around. I mean, I know a lot of the information I got in the early days was based off what he had on his website. Um, I've added to that. I've actually done some like reverse engineering on some of the circuitry, like the actual um, processor board, the MPU board. I've actually figured out the VCOs, because it's got two VCO loops on there, and they tie together. And I actually did some notes, I put like an Excel file together, which allows you to troubleshoot the VCO. So if you've got a problem with a particular symptom on that board, it can tell you where which VCO loop to look at, what it should be getting, and helps you diagnose it. So I actually did some reverse engineering of that part, because I've seen these problems so many times. On these things, uh, it's usually bad. To, usually due to bad capacitors on that board, but not always. Um, so I, I've done some stuff on those as well myself. Um, but there's um, him, and there's another site, which, um, which was helpful too. What was that one called? It had some information about some stuff which Roger Bird didn't have. Can't think what it was now, but I grabbed it all anyway. Some of put on my own website, like my radio mod site, a lot of it's on there, but not all of it, so I don't put everything there. Although, to be honest, I haven't actually updated that site in years, so, you know, not really. On a TM1 forum. TM1, I don't know that forum. You better tell me where that one is, I don't know it. Um, are the radios using SDR? I imagine there probably are, but I don't know. I don't tend to see a lot of the modern stuff. The latest radios, I don't tend to see them. CB radio is pretty dead over here, to be honest. Yeah, Ray, give us that link for that TM1 forum, because I don't know what. I'm not familiar with that one. I haven't really been to the CB side that much for a while. Also, my radio mods forum was quite big for a while. Um, 
it was probably one of the most active ones for a long time until CB tricks started coming up and um, getting better. Hey Kim, how's it going? Um, so once CB tricks got pretty good, then my form actually dropped off a bit and I actually lost interest in it as well. Went off and did other things too. So um, it's not as good as it used to be, my form. There's still a lot of information on there, which is why I've been taking it down, it's still there. But it gets constantly bombarded by spam bots and stuff like that. So, it's like, so I don't even have memberships on it anymore. I don't allow new membership, so it's it's pretty dead. It's more there for historical reasons, really. So, what's your website then? Your what's your form? Because I do like to sort of have information about places to find information. So um, any kind of thing that I do like to keep a track of if I come across them. I don't generally go searching for stuff, but I, it used to be that I, when I first started my website, if you, if you don't know what it is, it's radiomods.co.nz. Um, most people into CB would be aware of it because it's one of the bigger sites. And at one stage it was the biggest site. Um worldwide I think it's come down a bit now it might be number two or three or something on the night but um, and I did any information I found I put on my website so I basically all these places which are now long gone I made note of the information added it to my site but what I hadn't actually done at the time I hadn't actually kept a note of where these bits of information came from so I regretted not doing later on I actually wished I'd actually put a note on each page saying I found this at this web address, you know. Um, okay, let's go and look at this on a second. Did I get that right? Yep, there we go, found it. <clears throat> Radio manuals, oh yeah. That's your most active one. Cool, let's bookmark that. CB Ham Radio Bookmarks. Make sure I put them up in the most appropriate place. Yeah, okay. Because I've got loads and loads of manuals and stuff like that. I've got the Emperor TS5010 on there. Handy resource, very handy. Um, user manual, service manual. All right, so I have to get an account set up on there and um, so I can download other things. So I actually got loads of stuff as well myself. I've got folders and stuff. Um, very little of it's actually on my website, at least not on the public website. Some of it's on my members area. And a lot of it I don't even have online. So same thing with my, my test equipment manuals. I don't have a lot of stuff available online for the stuff I've, I've collected over the years. So yeah. Yeah, thanks for it. Um, yeah, you can get the right kind. You can just get you get stuck into it. You just, get, you just overdo it. I think that's how it was my radio mod site. I was I did that for years, just constantly updating, adding stuff to it. A lot of my stuff a daily basis. I was doing stuff, and then one day I just sort of sat back and thought, hmm, I think I've done enough now. <laughs> Hot linking, yes. You, sometimes on servers, if you've got your own web server set up, you can actually block hot linking. You can actually disable it in cPanel if you've got access to it. Sometimes you can do that. And under the security scenes, I think it is in there. You can block hot linking. Um, yeah. 
So I'll create an account later on and, I've, and maybe grab some stuff off there which might be relevant to me. Like I picked up the HR2510 service manual electronic copies some time ago. I've actually just recently purchased an original manual. HR2510 service manual, physical book. Um, I'm waiting for it to arrive. It hasn't arrived yet. I found it on eBay and I managed to grab it. And apparently it arrived in the country two weeks ago, but it still hasn't arrived yet. So hopefully NZ Post haven't lost it. I've been watching for one of those account for years. Last time you see me was 1974. Yeah, I mean, I... My, um... I was on CB a lot when I was, I don't know, 13, 13 years old. So I basically started getting on there and uh, back in the UK. So when I started getting into the electronic side of CBs as well, and started tinkering with them. Um, I probably stopped using radio 20, 25 years ago in a while. Um, I was using it a bit over here in New Zealand. It wasn't very popular anyway, but I did do it a little bit over here. And um, but I don't even have an antenna up or anything like that, so I just I just tinker with the things and fix them and stuff like that. Now that's all I really do, and that's not really that much work. I just there's not that much demand for it over here, so it's few and far between. And often someone will approach me and say, oh, "I want a radio done," and I will reply to them. I don't even respond. It's like, okay, <laughs> you know, if you, it's a few times I do get inquiries about doing CB work. Sometimes I just I don't hear back from them again. I say, yeah, sure, I'll look at it for you, and then I don't hear from them again. Uh, CB Radio Legal in 1984. I don't think it was. I think it was 1981, wasn't it, when it went legal? That's why the 2781 sticker on the front of the radios. I think that's what it was, wasn't it? Get your own server to yourself, no shit hosting. So if you've got a cPanel, then you can probably um, tell it to stop to block hot linking. Yeah. I mean, radio work is few and far between. I mean, once I started doing the YouTube channel and doing the test gear stuff, then my interest in CB work and repairs dropped off quite a bit because there's no money in it, right, for a start. So the motivation isn't great. It's more of a thing to keep me busy and the satisfaction of fixing things, right, which is what I've always been like anyway. But there wasn't really much value in it. I, mean, I might spend a week entire week fixing a radio and also can't charge for a week's worth of work I might only charge $50 right so you know there's no money in it um, in that way but obviously it's for the satisfaction of fixing something and keeping something on operation but um, since I started doing the test gear side of things and YouTube those take up my channel my channel because say those take up my time a lot more and so when I had lots of free time I didn't really mind doing it but now I don't have much free time I say after having two months off work um, then the interest isn't so much there I'd rather be doing other things you know when I'm, I'm time constrained or I'll be doing my YouTube channel making videos you know and fixing bits of test gear and things like that you know so but that's why I started doing a couple of CB radio videos recently because I had this free time I have some projects I finished which is good I have things which I've had sitting there for like a year or so which I've meant to get done, so I've got those projects done. Um, and then I thought, right, I need to get rid of some of these radios and start working on those. And so that's why I've been doing a few videos about CB. So I've got some more to come. We'll see how we go. But right now, I'm concentrating now on this software. This is my latest thing. You know, this is my new fad, is trying to get this software to work. And I get that working to communicate with the signal and stuff. And I'll probably go back to doing some CB again, but it depends how much longer I'm off work. I mean, I don't know. It's open ended at this moment. I don't know where I'm going back because I don't know how long the border's going to be up there for. Um, I 
Yeah, I've noticed with lockdowns that um, when I've had stuff for sale on Trade Me, which is the local auction site, I've noticed that during the lockdown, things which have been sitting there for a while, not selling, have suddenly sold. So like some CB stuff. CB stuff has definitely surged a bit during the lockdowns. I've sold some radios, sold some microphones, a few bits and pieces like that, you know. Um, I've noticed that I've had a radio there sitting there for a while, it hasn't sold, or a microphone sitting there for a while, it's not sold, and then lockdown hits and suddenly, oh look, it's sold, you know. So I do actually have some things in there like um, those Datron multimeters, the 1062s, which I've repaired. I've got three of those on Trade Me. Um, so I would try to sell them. And that seems people aren't really valuing what they can do, but gradually dropping the prices down. But I've got to the point now where I can't really drop them down any further. I don't know, Fred. Yes, anyway. So, yes. Is there anything else we can tinker around? I mean, I was tempted to tinker around with some power supplies, like some other ones. Um, what's the wrong window to do this? So, get on that one. Just about. So right in front of the auto transformer there, or to the right, or sorry, the left of the auto transformer. I'll get it right in a minute, or correct in a minute. There's a um, couple of plug packs. So one's an AC, out AC, so it's a transformer inside it. And one is a 5 volt plug pack. Or two there, what's the other one? Don't one of them was a 5 volt converter like a USB output on it and it's brand new, never used came with something I bought, bought some time ago I don't know when, maybe a year or two ago and I looked at it oh yeah, okay, put it on the shelf because I didn't need it and I went to go and use it um, about a month ago I found it, it's completely dead it doesn't work at all, you plug it in, there's no power output and it's brand new so that's something I do want to pull apart but I've actually done a video on Another AC plug pack, so that's, again just a transformer inside it, the old style ones, and just so it's AC, AC output, which had failed. I was using this on the snail fence, which I did a video on. You know, I've recorded footage on this other AC plug pack, which I repaired. So I, I pulled it apart, replaced the thermal fuse, which is inside the transformer, underneath the tape on the windings. So I took the thermal fuse out, replaced it with another fuse, and that got it working again. I've got another one I've seen over there. So what I've actually used is these things on a snail fence, and when I think when it rains, maybe the, the resistance of the snail fence goes down too much, it's overloading the power supply, overheating it, and then blowing the fuse. Yeah, so. Um, been up to eyes and repair since it all started. Oh, yeah. Do I have linear power supplies? What to repair or just generally, you mean? Um, like the... I've got this view. So you can see I've got, a, I've got two linear power supplies here on my desk. So I've got the... Um, to the right of the, the auto transformer. I've got a big triple output linear supply there. And I've got the signal one above that on top of it. So I do actually have two linear power supplies there. I've also got some... Um, HP Agilent, Agilent, yeah, is it Agilent? I think it might have been. Um, E3642A, was it? Um, I thought one of those. I did have three, I sold two. I picked up three broken ones, different times on eBay. Did videos about them, sold two of them. Got one left, I decided to keep one. Um, I got that, um, which is like 20 volts at. I'm sure what the current was now, I think it was only a couple of amps, it wasn't much. But they're quite nice supplies. And I've also got a signal there. I've got the Astron VS35M, a big honking power supply. 
Um, I might have to do a video on it actually at some point because the output was being a bit flaky. It's um, a bit erratic. I don't know if it's solved or not yet. I think I've probably solved it though. I pulled it apart and sprayed some contact cleaner inside the controls on the front panel and the problem seems to have gone away so I think it's, it's fine. I should probably overhaul it, pull it apart and service it because I've had the thing for 30 years. Yes, yeah, 30 years old. So it really should probably have the um, thermal paste replaced on the transformers and stuff on the transformers on the transistors and that sort of stuff. RM, yeah, the v, the VS is the variable one. So RM's got the meters on the front, but no knobs. Mine's got the knobs on, so you can adjust the current and voltage. So that's the only difference, I think. I think it's even the same circuit board. I've actually got circuit diagrams for this thing as well. I actually picked those up. So um, the, all, all the Astron supplies are very similar. It's got the same topology. If you'd like to see a video on linear power supply repair or servicing. Hmm, okay. Well, so I've done videos on the adjunct supplies. Hold on a second, let me find them. Maybe you haven't seen them, it might have been before you found my channel. Um, let's try and find them. Adjunct. Uh, E three six four six A. That's the that's the model numbers. I'll show this up here. So this is my list of them here. I've got four videos on these power supplies, like these ones here. So if you want to see those ones? It might satisfy your need. Um, This bit we were repeat with us last week. What your um, your three six four six? These are different faults. I had some with um, supervisor IC issues. I had some issues with some feedback circuitry, like um, autocouplers. And, um, Kind of issues with recapping as well, some bad caps. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Johnny, just sold him one and just get him really slow postage. You might be getting next Christmas. <laughs> You're leaning your power supply, right? Um, anyway, 40 amp, 40 amp power supply, nice. Well my um, Astron supply, I'm not sure that it's actually able to do the current anymore. I'm pretty sure it's struggling a little bit with the higher currents. I've seen it misbehave a bit, but that could have been from the knobs on the front, the controls being dirty, so maybe it wasn't actually setting the correct current limit. Um, I haven't tried putting any big currents through it since then. Um, what was that? I was trying to calibrate the time. I think I was trying to use it as a current source to calibrate that main now um, DC electronic load, which I showed you at the beginning. I think I was trying to use it for that because it could generate, you know. In excess of 20 amps easily, um, so I thought I'd try to use it for that. I think it wouldn't do it, but um, or maybe it is a surge current or something like that. I didn't like, I'm not sure. I didn't like the inrush current, that's what made it crowbar over or something, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, anyway, I think I'm gonna call it a day, fix something, have a chat. I'm just gonna get back onto this software and see if I can get the software because I. It'll be really nice when I get this software to work. 
and get these sequence controlled from a Mac. That'd be awesome if I can get that working. So I'd actually like to try and do that today. Or at least try and get it so I can remember how to write the code. You know, writing code's nice if you can remember how to do it. <laughs> so. Oh, I did the PLs, are you? Um, the tutorials I was thinking about doing were more about repairs. So I was thinking about teaching diagnostics processes, so how to fix things, you know. So I was, that's what's been in my head recently, the past couple of months, a few months maybe, is um, is trying to do a video series on how to fix things, you know, what to look for, what what symptoms there are, what kinds of things to check, um, you know, shortcuts, things like that. Um, based on my experience, I mean, honestly, I'm not qualified as such. Um, I don't have any formal qualifications, I haven't done any formal training, no formal education, I'm not an electronics engineer, I've never been to university and all like that, so all I know is from what I've learnt by doing. So. Um, some might say that's better, some might say that's worse. I don't know, it depends on your opinion. I don't really care. I just know what I know, and I don't know what I don't know. It's like everybody else. So, I think I'm doing a series on that and trying to do some kind of structured learning like that to try and say, hey, if you've got this kind of fault, these are the things you look for, or these are the kind of parts you have to keep an eye on, that sort of thing. And, and just do something. I don't know how big it ended up being, but. Um, just try and teach some repair stuff. That's what I had in mind. So I don't know. I I want to do it, but figuring out structure and how I want to do it and what it's going to look like in the end, I don't know yet. As you've got no demand for those things, really. So is it? So is a USB GPID adapter, so it's, is that like an Agilent one? Those Agilent branded ones, um, like those. Here's mine. Oh, sorry. I think it's on the back of the units. Um, yeah. Well, anything I've got to do in communication with the gear, Rob, could be handy. Um, let me know what you'd want for it and maybe I'll get it anyway just as an option you know I like to have options I like to keep options open who knows what I'm going to use in the future maybe it's not now but it might be later I don't know um, yeah bear that in mind Rob we'll, we'll think about it I, it's possible I'll get it off you anyway regardless just as an option. I mean, if I can get this thing working over LAN, that'd be ideal. But maybe I can add different communication protocols later on. All right. Um, you're some of the best troubleshooters aren't formally trained. Yeah, because you, you teach yourself how to learn and you teach yourself how to do it. You know, formal training doesn't necessarily tell you how to think. Yes, yeah, something you have to learn. Yeah. Okay, Rob, we'll, we'll sort that next time. I'll, maybe we can catch up and do that, um, and give me that pass pipe for the review, then maybe grab, grab it, bring it with you that time when we can finally catch up, and I'll play around with it then. Sounds like a plan. Brother's got a dog trotted mess, but can't screw, fix a screw to a wall. Yeah, it's about different mental capacities, though, isn't it? I mean, some people are extremely clever, but they've got absolutely no common sense. Um, you know, some people are, are outstandingly clever, but you think you're so smart and yet you're so dumb at the same time. You know, that happens. Um, and then you get people who've got incredible, incredible um, practical skills. And I, I know as a guy at work, really good practical skills, right, in mechanical aspects, right, mechanical skills um, has trouble with written English right so he is English speaking but 
his writing and spelling are extremely bad, right? But he's got great skills. He's a really clever guy. And it's practically, you know, you give him a job to do, he'll get it done, you know. And great skills, but language isn't one of them. You know, everyone's got their strengths, haven't they? You know. Anyway, I'm waffling again. So we're going to cut this off. And I'll go back and play with the software and see if I can get this thing to work. <laughs> so now there's only screws he's got to turn it by. He can calculate how many turns he's got to do because the Archimedes screw effect, the wedge, because that's what screws is a wedge. Dyslexic people are very clever generally. Yeah, can be, yeah. Um, just the brain works differently. You know? Anyway. Right, I'm going to cut this off. I'll catch you all later on. Thanks for dropping by. And um, I don't know if, when I'll be live streaming again next. When I've got something to work with, something to work on, then I'll do another live stream. Who knows? Maybe about software. I'll get software working. Maybe I'll do a stream about that. Okay. Catch you later. Thanks for dropping by. And I've got to click the end thing and have the uncomfortable wait. You know, we all. Bye.